one of my best friends um, from Alabama on the phone because I want to, for the first time, tell my story in its entirety. Um, I'm going to be doing a series of videos because my entire story would be too long in one sitting. Um, but this is a story that's never been told and at this point I'm ready to tell it in hopes that it helps you out there um, on your journey um, of healing. Um, I want others to realize that through the darkness you can emerge a butterfly, something beautiful. Because success is not measured about where you are right now. It's measured through what you've overcome and are able to achieve. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Donna. Hi, Donna. Hi, Rinda. Hi, everybody. I just want to say that Rinda and I have been friends for a long time, and I've watched her. Although I didn't know her growing up, I've watched her grow and change through seeking truth and clarity and healing overcoming narcissistic abuse and I just want to say that Rinda today is like the the person in the helicopter above the cloud and if you're under the cloud and still in the storm you do need somebody that can see the way out that can help you guide you out of the storm and and Rinda has overcome so much and I'm such an honor to know her and Rinda um, you know why don't you just start with with uh, with your birth tell, tell them the circumstances surrounding your your debut into the world oh, that's interesting um, the day that I was born um, my dad had to be pulled out of a bar um, and so he was inebriated at the hospital and it was of no use to my mom whatsoever. Um, and then when I made my entrance, my mom was sorely disappointed because I was a girl and not a boy. Um, she desperately wanted a boy, I guess to complete the, she, I already had a sister, so I guess it was to complete the perfect family. Um, and so strike one and two was uh, my dad was drunk. Um, strike two was that I was a girl and then uh, the, my third strike was that my dad named me after his boss's secretary, which I don't know the story behind why he did that, but um, I was resented from day one. Well, um, what kind of adverse effects did that have on you? I mean, you, um, you were too young to to know any of that, I'm sure, but did, did it cause any, any, any sickness or anything of that um, nature? I was told, you know, and, and I was told early in, early in life, I remember, I don't know, at four years old, I was told that I was in a hospital for six weeks. And it wasn't until after 2007 when my mom passed away that I actually found out why I was in the hospital. And um, a family member had told me that it was actually for malnut malnutrition. Um, that my mom basically stopped feeding me um, because she didn't want me. She hated me that much that she didn't want me, so she just was starving me. And um, one of my aunts had come over to the house and basically made her take me to the hospital. And I ended up in an incubator uh, for six weeks where the only people that could see me were my parents and they, I couldn't be picked up and held. Um, they had to touch me through the holes in, in the incubator. Um, and then after I was released from the hospital, um, I was told that uh, my mom actually tried to give me away to one of my aunts. Um, and you know, and I, I'm still confused as to, to the fact of you know, at this point, why didn't, you know, why didn't somebody take me away from her? Um, but back in, back in that time, you know, it was kind of like you had her and you raise her. Um, but I mean, that's just what it was. What happened to you when you were, um, four? What, what, 
what did she do when she went in? Did she go in somewhere and leave you in the car? Yeah, we had we had just moved to Alabama when I was four. We had moved to Alabama, and um, I remember this like it was yesterday. Actually, um, it was in the summertime. My mom had gone to go get her hair done, and she had my sister and I with her. And she took my sister um, into the into the beauty shop, and I went to get out of the car, and she said, "No, you stay." And uh, because there's no room for you in there and so she left me in the car and with the windows rolled up and actually dared me to roll the windows down so here it is Alabama summer it's hot and I'm stuck in a car with terrified to roll down the windows and so did anybody walk by and see you Rinda? um i really don't know because at some point i was just so, i mean i was so miserable i was just laying on the back seat of the car um and afterwards we had gone up to to see my, one of my aunts and my head was soaking wet um my um my aunt questioned my mother as to why my head was wet and she told her it was none of her business and you know uh, and and don't talk to me don't give me anything to drink you know and then she went off to the bathroom and you know my aunt actually she was she was a lot of my saving grace as a kid where I got my love and affection because I remember hiding this, there was a space between the cabinet and the refrigerator and I used to remember hiding this beside the two just to get kisses from her and, and affection because if my mom ever saw it then I would get in trouble for it and then and then my aunt would get punished for my mom and by my mom for my mom wouldn't speak to her so um, you know that was the love and affection that I got was from my aunt and it had to be a secret well that did give you hope that there was something out there it, it, that's what you were getting at home. It it did. Um, it 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 did. And I always I always liked going up to to her house um, until my uncle started molesting me, um, and then and then I I dreaded going up there, and um, you know that's that started really at age four. Um, you know later later on. And, and uh, I remember the first time that it, that it happened, you know, I, I went and told my mom and I got spanked for it. Um, and my mom said, you know, just shut up and go back. And I was confused. I was really confused as to why my mom wouldn't protect me right. from something right. like that. A lot of things happened to you when you were four. Um, Tell them, tell them the story about your arm. <laughs> um, so after the abuse had started with my uncle, um, yeah, and a lot of things did happen when I was four. Um, I remember we had this little rocking chair, and I would sit in the rocking chair and rock back and forth, hitting the bed and, and swinging back. And the chair would move ever so much each time. And one time... I missed the bed and I landed and I broke my arm. I broke my right arm. And when that happened, I, I didn't cry. Um, m matter of fact, my eldest sister was in the room and she I begged her not to tell my mother. Um, you know, and I didn't cry. Uh, no, I didn't cry. I, I because I, I didn't want to get in trouble. I, I, I just didn't want to get in trouble. You got you got in trouble for showing emotion when you were hurt. I did, I did. So, um, I learned not to cry at a very early age, because crying meant you got more punishment. Um, right. And so, on the way, um, for, you know, so my sister told told on me and. On the way to the hospital, you know, my mom is telling me how stupid I was. My dad is sitting there holding me, moving my arm back and forth, asking me if it hurts. You know, and all the while, I'm, you know, I'm in agonizing pain 
but I wouldn't cry because I didn't want to get in trouble. Um, and so I uh, got we got to the hospital. My arm got put in a, in a cast. Um, I I remember the sling. It was a it was a watermelon sling, and that was like I, because I got to pick it, and it, you know that was like the happy moment of the whole thing. Um, and then we got home, and my mom basically just tossed me to the side. Um, you know, here I am. I, I'm right-handed. I couldn't really feed myself. Um, I couldn't clothe. I couldn't dress myself at that point. And so basically, uh, my eldest sister really had to take care of me because my mom was like, "Well, that's what you get for being dumb," and um, and just dismissed me, discarded me. Um, and so, um, if it weren't for my eldest sister being there, I'd have been pretty much on my, I would have been on my own. Um, was your dad, was your dad afraid of her? My dad was terrified of my mother. Um, my dad, um, oftentimes, you know, he wouldn't come home, um, from work on Fridays. He would go to the bars and we wouldn't see him, you know, unless he, one, he ran out of money or, or two um it was sunday afternoon you know so we didn't really know we didn't really know uh what kind of shape he would come home in and oftentimes when he would come home there would be uh, fights between him and my mother um my mother oftentimes she hit him in the head with an iron skillet she broke brooms over his back um as i got older um, my sister and I would have to drag him out to the street to be arrested um, because him and my mom would get into it and my mom was like get him out of here and the, the police would only arrest them <clears throat> in the street because otherwise it was private property um, did, did your mom did your mom tell you and your sister to drag him to the street yes my mom told us yeah my mom would tell us to get him out and, and make us drag him out to the street. Um, there were times where my mother was kicking him out of the house and my sister and I uh, would have to uh, throw his clothes out in the front yard, um, you know, because she was, she didn't want him there anymore. So, you know, there was, uh, it was chaotic. It, um, it was, you know, my yeah. sister and I are throwing our dad's clothes out in the yard and, you know, um, my mom saying he's gone he's gone and then next thing you know dad's picking up his clothes and bringing them back in the house and putting them all putting them away so it was it was very confusing and chaotic um right you know um but and i remember i remember at um i was four when this happened too um my dad had come home um had lost his keys um, had come home and he had busted the glass in the back sliding door and he had blood on his hand um, but my sister and I were sleeping and we woke up to the noise and I saw blood on the wall um, and I thought you know here I am four years four four years old and I thought he killed my mom you know um, and so it's like I started screaming and my sister um, put her hand over her, my mouth and, and drug me back in the bedroom to keep me safe from him. Um, you know, and, and come to find out, you know, because we went looking for our mom and she wasn't in the house, you know, so we were in the house with him and he's drunk. My mom had gone next door actually to call the police um, and we had a dog. Um, his name, he was a pit bull. His name was Junior. And he actually got between um, my dad and my sister and I, um, the one that's closest in age to me, and he actually wouldn't let him come near us. Um, you know, so he stayed between between us and him. But um, yeah, that night my dad was arrested. Um, you know, and was he trying to harm you? No, he wasn't actually. Um, he was. Um, he wasn't. He. My dad, when he was drinking, he never did anything to hurt my sister and I. Um, it was always aggression towards my mother, um, and right. I think that that's the only time that really he had, he had the courage to stand up to her is when he was drinking. Um, you right. know, so so. What, 
looking know, back, looking back, do you think do you think he was self medicating? Oh, I know my dad was self medicating. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I know that he was. I mean, considering how he grew up, because um, he had a rough childhood. Um, and his father was absent. So he grew up in an alcoholic home as well. And, you know, alcoholism runs in families. Um, right. But it's, but it's, it stopped, uh, with him because, because of him, my sister and I, uh, we didn't have the desire to, to live a life that way. Um, right. so it, the alcoholism, it actually stopped with, with him. Um, you know, but, but going back, you know, to what else happened when I was four, um, oh, and this, this was, we were, there was a trip that summer, it was after I broke my arm, and there was a trip that we were going down to Florida, and we were going to go to Disney World, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, of course, fun, right? <laughs> uh, well, not for me, because um, I had a cast on my arm, and so... I remember my mom, uh, they were going to go on the teacups, and my mom said that I couldn't ride it because I couldn't hang on. And so I got left standing there by myself while everyone else rode the teacups. And actually not long ago I came across a picture of me standing there with my cast on, standing there pouting um, because I didn't get to ride the teacups too. So, you know, but here I am standing in this public place, you know, and I, I, I just looked at that picture and I was like, how sad, because there's nobody with me. I'm four and I'm standing there alone, you know. Um, and again, my mom said, well, that's what you get for being stupid and breaking your arm. So, and then um, we went, we went to the ocean and it's like I had to, have somebody because I couldn't get my cast wet so I had to have somebody either hold me or I couldn't go in the water um, and then my I remember my mom um, cutting my cast off um, when we were down there so so that was my experience why? at four. Oh, because why, why did she do that um I wanted to go in the water and she didn't want to hold me why, and, and you know or put something over the I don't, I don't know really why she was just like I'm taking it off and so that's what she did she took the cast off for her was that for her convenience I think so yeah I think yeah. so I think so well um did your did your parents make it or did they get divorced um my parents got divorced and actually they got divorced when I was nine uh, but my dad lived with us until I was 13 and um, what a better way to come home from your first day of high school as to being told um, your dad's moving out um, you know and I, I didn't understand why but but then I was told that you know we've been divorced since you know for however many years and he just hasn't moved out because you weren't emotionally mature enough to understand so basically so, basically I was I was blamed for my dad remaining in the house from the ages from 9 to 13 because I wasn't emotionally mature enough to understand them getting divorced so your your reality was really altered, huh? Oh, much uh, definitely it was altered. Um, you know because here, I, go ahead. Here, here I thought you know that I mean my parents were together and come to find out you know they. I mean, I knew that it was weird because my dad slept on the couch and my mom stayed hibernated in her room with her romance novels, but. Um, I never, never would have known that they were divorced, and then and then to be blamed on top of it for for the divorce, you know, for for him staying there after they got divorced. And what what was your mom's occupation at the time? Uh, my mom had a home daycare. So, um, and and she had that. I don't know from the time that as long. Well, actually, I think from the time. I started school, and I started school when I was four. Um, 
but uh, and and that's an interesting story too because here I started school when I was four. I didn't think anything of it, but basically it was because my mom didn't want me in the house. Um, you know, I uh, I didn't find out until I was thirteen. Um, because we had, I didn't find out thirteen until I was thirteen when my actual birthday was, um, because my birthday, it was celebrated um, in September. Um, I that's when I thought my birthday was. That's you know up until I got into high school and needed my original birth certificate to play basketball, and then um, you know I gave her, I gave my coach my original birth certificate, and she looked at me and she said, "I thought that your birthday was in." September and I said it is and she said not according to this piece of paper and so I was completely confused because every year and um, every year we would celebrate my birthday in September and I would get this and I hate these things now a cookie cake you know and it would have happy mm -hmm. birthday Rinda on it and that's that's all I never had a birthday party um, I never I just got this stupid cookie cake that I hated. Um, and then when I found out when my actual birthday was, I confronted my mom and she's like, oh, you were never supposed to find out. You know, but yes, your actual birthday is in December. You know, um, so mass confusion there because I didn't understand, well, why, did, why don't you celebrate my birthday when it actually is? And the reason for that is because she just didn't want me, she didn't want me at home. You know, she she just didn't right. want me there. Um, so she and, and you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, she just pawned me off. She put me in school. She her excuse was that I already knew how to, I already knew how to write. I already knew my ABCs. I could count to a hundred. I knew all the things that you were supposed to know in kindergarten. So therefore, you know, for my own good, she put me in school, which always made me the youngest. In right. my class, right, and then and you and you found that out shortly after you found out that your parents were divorced, right? Which mm -hmm. really rocked your reality, right? Because we started school in August, and I found out in like October um, when my birthday was. So we had just celebrated my birthday, my my fake birthday, um, mm -hmm. and so then actually when my real birthday came came around in. In December, actually, I was at a basketball game, and my teammates, um, I had, they, they actually threw me like a mini party right before the game, so. Aww. Yeah. How so, sweet. And, and, and that was actually the first year, that was the first and only year um, that I had a birthday party, um, because I never had another one after that, because right before the people were coming over, my mom and my sister took my undergarments and hung them on the faint on the ceiling fan and turned it on so they were spinning around when my friends got there. So I was completely and totally embarrassed. So that's the last time that's the one and only time that I had a birthday party. So I guess that was a joke to be that was a, to the, yeah to them it was a joke but to me it was completely humiliating and matter matter of fact once everybody once everybody got there we actually left the house we didn't we didn't stay at the house we we walked the neighborhood actually was there anything else significant with your your mom in the daycare that you care to share um yeah when I was, I guess I was like nine or 10 years old. Um, first of all, you know, having the daycare, um, when I was home, I had to run it basically. Um, in the mornings I would have to get up, uh, prior, uh, prior to the first child arriving and the first kid arrived, came at like either six or six thirty in the morning. So I had to be up and ready for school and, and there to greet that first daycare child. Um, and, and, and then after school, I had to take care of the kids. And in the summertime, I took care of the kids for the majority of, of the time. Um, Why? What was your mother doing? Um, she was either in her room reading or she was um, tied up and watching soap operas. She was doing her, she was doing her own thing. 
Um, and then um, she didn't like hearing the she didn't like hearing the kids cry. Um, so she had a regular habit of putting her hand like over their mouth and nose um, to stop them from crying. And it was basically cutting off air supply and, until they just they they quit they quit they quit fighting it and you know um, a lot and a lot of times um, that would happen. You know, and and the kid would be okay. The, 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 was, that, was that a frequent occurrence? Um, it it happened more often than not. Um, but one time it went too far. Um, what happened? There was a little boy. Um, and he was crying, and I was in there trying to take care of him to get him to stop crying because I knew that. And it, th this is really hard. Um, I knew that if he didn't stop crying that she was going to come in and do that. And so I was trying to comfort him, but she came in anyway. Um, and she put her hand over his mouth and nose and said, this is what you do to get him to stop. And um, so she was teaching me how, how to, to do that. And um, it, it went too far. And he, and he died. Um, and she, and I stood there and I watched it. Um, were you holding, were you holding him? Uh, no, I wasn't. I was just, I was just standing there, um, because he was laying in the crib. Um, and, uh, he, um, he just stopped moving. And then my mother looked at me and said, if you ever breathe a word of this, that's what's going to happen to you. Um, and then about that time, my dad came in from work. Um, this is before he moved out. He came in from work. My mom acted all frantic. Um, you know, at, but she already knew that he was, she already knew the little boy was dead. Um, but she acted all frantic. My dad um, took him outside and, and, and started CPR. The, the, the ambulance was, paramedics were called. Um, and that death was ruled SIDS. Um, sudden infant death syndrome. Sudden, sudden infant death syndrome. Yeah, but I stood there and, and nobody, nobody knew. Nobody knew the truth. Nobody knew the truth of what happened. But a nine-year-old little girl. Right. That was terrified to ever say anything. And I lived with that until after my mother passed away because I, I didn't dare, didn't dare ever bring it up, um, because even as an adult, I was terrified of her. That's way too much for a nine-year-old to carry around. Well, I mean, yeah, it was, but I mean, that was my, that was my reality, you know, that, that was, that was my life. That was what was going on. Well, I know your story consists of um, ways that you that you coped um, <clears throat> off the cuff here. I want to ask you because um, you you took me to your childhood home and you took me in your room and you showed me where your bed was and you told me what you used to do. I used to hide under you, there. I mean, I, that yeah. was, you know, we had we had trundle beds, so one went one way and one pulled out that you know it would slide, and then it would create a space back behind it. And I used to regularly hide back there, and and there were drawers on the other side, so I would keep crayons and things, you know, in the drawer so I could reach in. And I used to write, "I hate mom" underneath the, underneath the top bed. Um, but I would I would I would hide from her. I mean. I would, that's, that's where I would go it, it, to hide from her is underneath the bed just so is, that I didn't that, get hit. Is that, is, that still, is that still written on, on the bed? Um, as far as I know, yeah, it is still there. It's still there. My niece has the bed now. <laughs> My niece has the bed now. And as far as I know, yeah, that's, that, that's still there, written on there in crayon. You ought to take a picture of that. 
you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that I would ever want to because it's, it's, yeah. it's really painful, you know, to, to know that, you know, you, I had to learn to walk from one end of the house to the other without making a noise, without breathing, without taking a breath, because if I walked by her and she noticed me, I would get hit. Um, because she was, you know, either frustrated with my dad or, you know, whatever it was, it was just, if she, as soon as she saw me, then, then, then I got hit. Um, you know, if, if she, I don't know, made a mistake in her cross stitch, well, guess what? Then I got hit for that. Um, yeah. and so I learned, I learned to be invisible. I, I learned to, um, to basically not exist in, 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 to her, you know, um, because I never sought affection from her after I learned that it just came with more pain. Um, the, uh, would you, would you, would you say you were a scapegoat? Oh, I was definitely a scapegoat child. Um, you know, and, and, and I guess that's why it was, it was easy for me to detach from her because once I learned that I wasn't going to get my needs met through her, um, I, I learned to become very independent, you know, and, and that's really harmed me in relationships, um, because I am so very independent. Um, but I had, I, I had to be, I had to be as a child, I had to be very self-reliant and very independent because I couldn't, I couldn't get the love that I needed from her, um, which in, in all actuality, it set me up. Um, for for what happened when I was in high school, um, it it totally set me up from for the, for what happened, because I was wasn't. She, which, was she ever was she ever honest or um, overt enough to say that she uh, wished you were never born? Oh, that was a regular occurrence. I I was told quite often. As a matter of fact, I remember one time specifically. Um, my dad had come over. This is after he had moved out. He came over to visit my sister and I, and I asked him to, for to to screw on uh, the knob on one of the dresser drawers, and she wanted his attention. And she looked at me, and and as he was walking outside, and she looked at me, and she goes, "You were a mistake, and I wish you were never born." And she said that in front of my sister and her boyfriend at the time. And so here I am, you know, I don't know, I was 13, 14 years old humiliated because she tells me that I was a mistake and never never wanted me in front of other people. And I guess that that was what was so bad is because it was in front of other people and you know my sister's boyfriend didn't know you know who she was and so that just totally shocked him. Um but um yeah. I mean it was just it was it was horrible, you know. Um I remember a time where you know, my mom was vacuuming, um, and I walked by at the wrong time, and so I got beat with the vacuum cleaner cord. Um, and and really, I don't know for what reason, um, other than I existed. Yeah. Did um, <clears throat> Did you make your own clothes? I did one summer. My mom didn't want to take me to shopping. Um, she bought my sister all all new clothes for summer, and she I had learned how to sew. Um, she had taught me how to sew, and which is a valuable skill. Which is a valuable skill. I was probably ten or eleven. Um, it was a valuable skill, um, you know, later in life. Um, but I mean, at ten years old, I'm, I'm I'm making my own clothes because my mom didn't see that necessary to to give me the same opportunities that she did my sister so I made my own clothes that summer so. you've overcome a lot well you said all of that set you up for something that happened in in high school yeah all of that you know um, because I didn't I didn't get the love and attention that I needed from my mom so you know what happens when you don't when you don't get it at home? You you get it you find it where you can, like me getting it from up at my aunt's house, you know, um, right. and and then you know after being spanked for telling that my uncle was was touching me inappropriately, you know that happened from the time I was four until I was twelve years old, 
um, <clears throat> the things that happened there are just kind of, are horrific. But it was it was just a life of I was somebody else's object. Um, not only my mother's punching bag, but then now to be somebody else's object, um, sexual object. And uh, so in high school, you know, I thought, okay, it's you know, it's over because my uncle stopped when I was 12 and then I get into high school and then I had a some oddly enough it was my uh, psychology teacher um, you know that's ironic yeah um, and I guess the thing of it is is like when you when you have been abused I guess it, it shows up a, 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 like a neon light across your forehead you know that um, mm -hmm. I'm a target um, you know, because that's exactly what I was, because he befriended me, and he, I thought that he genuinely cared. Um, he seemed concerned. He, you know, he had asked me about, you know, my life, and, um, you know, and one day I had come into class, and, and I actually, I had my mother's handprint across my face because I had gotten slapped right before school, and she hit me hard enough that it still left a mark. Um, and. I don't even know what I got hit for, um, and uh, but so that afternoon, you know, he held me after class and we talked. And that afternoon, he took me to his house, and um, that was the beginning of the end, really, for me because I lost my virginity that day. Um, he took me. How old? I was uh, I was thirteen or fourteen. It was um, I rem I rem. I don't remember exactly how old I was. I know exactly what I was wearing. Um, but uh, it was, he he took me to his house um, and he wanted to take photographs of me sitting on his diving board. And then he had me model um, his wife's lingerie um, and take pictures of me. And um, I was terrified. I didn't know what was happening. Um, I kind of had a suspicion, um, but I didn't say anything. I didn't say no. I didn't say I didn't want to. I didn't say I didn't feel comfortable with it. And then the next thing I know, he was leading me into the bedroom, and I knew that it was about to happen because I looked up at the top of the bed, and there was a condom laying there. And uh, that's the day that I lost my virginity. So. Was it the same year? you found out your parents were divorced and that your birthday was it, it was the birthday. same it was the same school year i was a freshman in high school i was i was a freshman in high school um when it started and um the sexual abuse continued actually until i was 22 or 22 with him did your mom meet him my mom knew him yes um because um after that first year of, of high school um, and him showing such interest in me and everything else, um, I actually started running track and cross country and he was the coach um, as well. And so um, I spent quite a bit of time with him um, outside of school. Um, and so my mom knew him as my coach and she thought that it was a great thing because he was showing interest in me and being the father figure that my father wasn't. Um, and oftentimes um, during the summer, um, he would wake me up. My mom would give him access to me sleeping um, and he would wake me up and I, I would leave with him and be gone all day. And um, daily, uh, I was... I was having sex with him, um, and my mom, my mom didn't know. Um, my mom just thought that he was just, you know, actually, I don't know if she really knew or not. She probably did, and she just didn't care um, because I wasn't, I wasn't a bother to her. I wasn't around, you know. So um, there were times that you know he came over to the house and. My mom had invited him over in the evenings and stuff, and he had been drinking, and he spent the night, um, you know. Um, your mom allowed a teacher to spend the night at your house? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and, and then at one point in time, one of the one of her really really good friends, you questioned the relationship between me and him, and then my mom, you know, acted like she was overly concerned, and then she forbade me to see him, and um, of course, you know, here I am, 16, 17 years old, so this has been going on for three or four years, and at this point, I was very attached, which is, I realize now it was a trauma bond um, that I had with him, but I wasn't going to uh, tell my mom, I wasn't going to have my mom tell me no, that I couldn't, couldn't interact with him. Um, and so I lied to my mom at one point and told her that I was going to go stay the night with a friend of mine and in all actuality I was spending the night with him is, would you say this is a, um, uh, an accurate statement that she facilitated that relationship She in a lot him. of ways yeah in a lot of ways she did facilitate that relationship um, she encouraged it she thought that it was a good quote-unquote good thing um because but when when someone else noticed that there might be something going on then she changed her mind because of how it made her look yes yes because not, of, not for your safety no no it was because it, it it you know it called into question her parenting you know and her concern for her child um so yeah it, it wasn't for my sake because if it was for my sake it would have never happened to begin with but for her uh, credibility and her um, I don't know her status I guess is lack of a better word um, then she started showing concern well would you would you say that everything that you have said thus far had any bearing on your decision to go into the military? Oh, I had everything to go with my decision. Um, actually, the coach and I had a discussion at one point in time about, you know, we had good discussions at times, and we talked about life, and he, he had told me that, you know, I needed to get out of there uh, because my mother would destroy my life. Um, and um, so that's what I did, is when I was 17 years old, um, I... I was going to go in the Marine Corps, and, and my uncle was like, no, you're not. Um, you're going to go in the Air Force if you're going to any branch. And so I didn't really care at that point um, because my mother had to sign for me. And um, so we went up to the recruiter's office. My The recruiter looked at me, and he was just like, you know, it's your decision. And, you know, I looked at my mom, and I said, either you sign the paperwork now or I'll go in the Marine Corps when I'm 18 and you can deal with my uncle and so she signed the paperwork and then on the way home she cried um, and said you know I'm losing my baby which <laughs> um, yeah so, and, and, and then, then yeah I, that was confusing to me too and I really had no sympathy for her at that point because I was just like you know you never cared about me my entire life and then now what your punching bag is leaving, and um, now you're going to have yeah, to. Yeah, her scapegoat. She's she's losing her scapegoat. Right, right. So, um, so then I went in the military when I was 17, and you know, for for my high school graduation, um, my dad showed up. My mom ran him off and told him he didn't deserve to be there. Um, so, I don't even know. I, I think that he stayed and just went up in the balcony and watched me graduate, but I'm not sure because I didn't see him there afterwards. Um, when I left for basic training, um, he wasn't welcome. Um, matter of fact, uh, when she signed the paperwork, one of the things that she said to me is, do not tell your father that you're going in, in the military. Um, and that she would beat me if I did because he was still paying child support. So um, that was her. Mm. So, you know, me, me leaving to go in the military would have, would have forsaken his child support. Right. Um, having to pay child support. Um, right. And right. so, um, so I didn't get to, I, I didn't see my dad the day that I left. Okay, back up just a little bit. Do, do you think that had anything to do with why she did not want to sign for you to go in? 
Um, I think that maybe I don't. I, I don't know. I can't. I mean, that's probably part of it. Um, you know, that's that's probably part of it. But you know, it was basically like either you sign for it then, or I'm just gonna go in the Marine Corps, and then you can deal with your brother. You know, which um, my right. uncle, um, he when he spoke, everybody listened. You know, so it was well. Just... Um, I know that I know that you found out something really interesting in the military about yourself, and I don't know if you want to wrap it up here and pick up there on the next video, or yeah. is there something else that you want to add? Yeah, I, I think here? that you know, for for right now, I mean, this is basically um, from birth to, I guess really my height until till I went into the military um, but I'm gonna cut it off for now um, but in in my next video I did I did discover um, that through the traumatic experiences of my childhood that I had developed it's called dissociative identity disorder um, and it didn't manifest until 2001 but I want to go into that more and what D, what it, it's called DID um, what that what that brought up for me, um, and I, I wanna... think I think most I think most people know that as multiple personality right, disorder. Right, right. It is. It is. That's DID, dissociative identity disorder, is the n new terminology for multiple personalities. So, okay. um, but I don't want to I don't want to go into that right now. That I'll make that the subject of my next video. Um, you know, I do want to wrap up. Um, and, and again, I'm not sharing my story for, for sympathy, but I want to get it out there for hope for other people who have gone through horrific childhoods that, that think that, you know, their life is destined to be dark and to be, to be doomed, and it's not, because I'm living proof of that. Um, yes, it, takes, it takes courage, it takes strength, and it takes a tremendous amount of So, I'm Rinda Hall. Um, again, this has been part one of my story. I will pick up next time with, um, you know, the dissociative identity disorder.